Reflections on the Revolution in France, and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event, in a letter intended to have been sent to a gentleman in Paris, 1790, by Edmund Burke. Dear Sir, You are pleased to call again, and with some earnestness, for my thoughts on the late proceedings in France. I will not give you reason to imagine that I think my sentiments of such value as to wish myself to be solicited about them. They are of too little consequence to be very anxiously either communicated or withheld. It was from attention to you and to you only that I hesitated at the time when you first desired to receive them. In the first letter I had the honor to write to you, and which at length I send, I wrote neither for nor from any description of men, nor shall I in this. My errors, if any, are my own. My reputation alone is to answer for them. You see, sir, by the long letter I have transmitted to you, that though I do most heartily wish that France may be animated by a spirit of rational liberty, and that I think you bound in all honest policy to provide a permanent body in which that spirit may reside, and an effectual organ by which it may act, it is my misfortune to entertain great doubts concerning several material points in your late transactions. You imagined, when you wrote last, that I might possibly be reckoned among the approvers of certain proceedings in France from the solemn public seal of sanction they have received from two clubs of gentlemen in London, called the Constitutional Society and the Revolution Society. I certainly have the honor to belong to more clubs than one, in which the constitution of this kingdom and the principles of the glorious revolution are held in high reverence, and I reckon myself among the most forward in my zeal for maintaining that constitution and those principles in their utmost purity and vigor. It is because I do so that I think it necessary for me that there should be no mistake. Those who cultivate the memory of our revolution and those who are attached to the constitution of this kingdom will take good care how they are involved with persons who, under the pretext of zeal toward the revolution and constitution, too frequently wander from their true principles, and are ready on every occasion to depart from the firm but cautious and deliberate spirit which produced the one, and which presides in the other. Before I proceed to answer the more material particulars in your letter, I shall beg leave to give you such information as I have been able to obtain of the two clubs which have thought proper as bodies to interfere in the concerns of france first assuring you that i am not and that i have never been a member of either of those societies the first calling itself the constitutional society or society for constitutional information or by some such title is i believe of seven or eight years standing the institution of this society appears to be of a charitable and so far of a laudable nature. It was intended for the circulation, at the expense of the members, of many books, which few others would be at the expense of buying, and which might lie on the hands of the booksellers, to the great loss of a useful body of men. Whether the books, so charitably circulated, were ever as charitably read is more than I know. Possibly several of them have been exported to France, and, like goods not in request here, may with you have found a market. I have heard much talk of the lights to be drawn from books that are sent from hence. What improvements they have had in their passage, as it is said some liquors are meliorated by crossing the sea, I cannot tell. But I never heard a man of common judgment or the least degree of information speak a word in praise of the greater part of the publications circulated by that society, nor have their proceedings been accounted, except by some of themselves, as of any serious consequence. Your National Assembly seems to entertain much the same opinion that I do of this poor charitable club. As a nation, you reserve the whole stock of your eloquent acknowledgments for the Revolution Society, when their fellows in the Constitutional were, in equity, entitled to some share. Since you have selected the Revolution Society as the great object of your national thanks and praises, you will think me excusable in making its late conduct the subject of my observations. The National Assembly of France has given importance to these gentlemen by adopting them, and they return the favor by acting as a committee in England for extending the principles of the National Assembly. 
henceforward we must consider them as a kind of privileged persons as no inconsiderable members in the diplomatic body this is one among the revolutions which have given splendor to obscurity and distinction to undiscerned merit until very lately i do not recollect to have heard of this club i am quite sure that it never occupied a moment of my thoughts nor i believe those of any person out of their own set i find upon inquiry that on the anniversary of the revolution in sixteen eighty eight a club of dissenters but of what denomination i know not have long had the custom of hearing a sermon in one of their churches and that afterwards they spend the day cheerfully as other clubs do at the tavern but i never heard that any public measure or political system much less that the merits of the constitution of any foreign nation had been the subject of a formal proceeding at their festivals until to my inexpressible surprise i found them in a sort of public capacity by a congratulatory address giving an authoritative sanction to the proceedings of the national assembly in france in the ancient principles and conduct of the club so far at least as they were declared i see nothing to which i could take exception i think it very probable that for some purpose new members may have entered among them and that some truly christian politicians who love to dispense benefits but are careful to conceal the hand which distributes the dole may have made them the instruments of their pious designs whatever i may have reason to suspect concerning private management i shall speak of nothing as of a certainty but what is public for one i should be sorry to be thought directly or indirectly concerned in their proceedings i certainly take my full share along with the rest of the world in my individual and private capacity in speculating on what has been done or is doing on the public stage in any place ancient or modern in the republic of rome or the republic of paris but having no general apostolic mission being a citizen of a particular state and being bound up in a considerable degree by its public will i should think it at least improper and irregular for me to open a formal public correspondence with the actual government of a foreign nation without the express authority of the government under which i live i should be still more unwilling to enter into that correspondence under anything like an equivocal description which to many unacquainted with our usages might make the address in which i joined appear as the act of persons in some sort of corporate capacity acknowledged by the laws of this kingdom and authorized to speak the sense of some part of it on account of the ambiguity and uncertainty of the authorized general descriptions and of the deceit which may be practised under them and not from mere formality the house of commons would reject the most sneaking petition for the most trifling object under that mode of signature to which you have thrown open the folding doors of your presence chamber and have ushered into your national assembly with as much ceremony and parade and with as great a bustle of applause as if you had been visited by the whole representative majesty of the whole english nation if what this society has thought proper to send forth had been a piece of argument it would have signified little whose argument it was it would be neither the more nor the less convincing on account of the party it came from but this is only a vote and resolution it stands solely on authority and in this case it is the mere authority of individuals few of whom appear their signatures ought in my opinion to have been annexed to their instrument the world would then have the means of knowing how many they are who they are and of what value their opinions may be from their personal abilities from their knowledge their experience or their lead in authority in this state to me who am but a plain man the proceeding looks a little too refined and too ingenuous it has too much the air of a political stratagem adopted for the sake of giving under a high-sounding name an importance to the public declarations of this club which when the matter came to be closely inspected they did not altogether so well deserve it is a policy that has very much the complexion of a fraud i flatter myself that i love a manly moral regulated liberty as well as any gentleman of that society be he who he will and perhaps i have given as good proofs of my attachment to that cause in the whole course of my public conduct 
I think I envy liberty as little as they do to any other nation. But I cannot stand forward and give praise or blame to anything which relates to human actions and human concerns on a simple view of the object as it stands stripped of every relation in all the nakedness and solitude of metaphysical abstraction circumstances which with some gentlemen pass for nothing give in reality to every political principle its distinguishing color and discriminating effect the circumstances are what render every civil and political scheme beneficial or noxious to mankind abstractedly speaking government as well as liberty is good yet could i in common sense ten years ago have felicitated france on her enjoyment of a government for she then had a government without inquiry what the nature of that government was or how it was administered can i now congratulate the same nation upon its freedom is it because liberty in the abstract may be classed amongst the blessings of mankind that I am seriously to felicitate a madman who has escaped from the protecting restraint and wholesome darkness of his cell on his restoration to the enjoyment of light and liberty? Am I to congratulate a highwayman and murderer who has broke prison upon the recovery of his natural rights? This would be to act over again the scene of the criminals condemned to the galleys and their heroic deliverer, the metaphysic knight of the sorrowful countenance, when i see the spirit of liberty in action i see a strong principle at work and this for a while is all i can possibly know of it the wild gas the fixed air is plainly broke loose but we ought to suspend our judgment until the first effervescence is a little subsided till the liquor is cleared until we see something deeper than the agitation of a troubled and frothy surface i must be tolerably sure before I venture publicly to congratulate men upon a blessing, that they have really received one. Flattery corrupts both the receiver and the giver, and adulation is not of more service to the people than to kings. I should, therefore, suspend my congratulations on the new liberty of France until I was informed how it had been combined with government, with public force, with the discipline and obedience of armies, with the collection of an effective and well-distributed revenue, with morality and religion, with the solidity of property, with peace and order, with civil and social manners. All these, in their way, are good things too, and without them liberty is not a benefit whilst it lasts, and is not likely to continue long. The effect of liberty to individuals is that they may do what they please, we ought to see what it will please them to do before we risk congratulations, which may be soon turned into complaints. Prudence would dictate this in the case of separate, insulated, private men. But liberty, when men act in bodies, is power. Considerate people, before they declare themselves, will observe the use which is made of power, and particularly of so trying a thing as new power in new persons, of whose principles, tempers, and dispositions they have little or no experience, and in situations where those who appear the most stirring in the scene may possibly not be the real movers. All these considerations, however, were below the transcendental dignity of the Revolution Society. Whilst I continued in the country from whence I had the honor of writing to you, I had but an imperfect idea of their transactions. On my coming to town, I sent for an account of their proceedings, which had been published by their authority, containing a sermon of Dr. Price, with the Duc de Rochefoucauld and the Archbishop of A's letter, and several other documents annexed. The whole of that publication, with the manifest design of connecting the affairs of France with those of England, by drawing us into an imitation of the conduct of the National Assembly, gave me a considerable degree of uneasiness. The effect of that conduct upon the power, credit, prosperity, and tranquillity of France became every day more evident. The form of constitution to be settled for its future polity became more clear. We are now in a condition to discern with tolerable exactness the true nature of the object held up to our imitation. If the prudence of reserve and decorum dictates silence in some circumstances, in others prudence of a higher order may justify us in speaking our thoughts. The beginnings of confusion with us in England are at present feeble enough. 
but with you we have seen an infancy still more feeble growing by moments into a strength to heap mountains upon mountains and to wage war with heaven itself whenever our neighbor's house is on fire it cannot be amiss for the engines to play a little on our own better to be despised for too anxious apprehensions than ruined by too confident a security solicitous chiefly for the peace of my own country but by no means unconcerned for yours i wish to communicate more largely what was at first intended only for your private satisfaction i shall still keep your affairs in my eye and continue to address myself to you indulging myself in the freedom of epistolary intercourse i beg leave to throw out my thoughts and express my feelings just as they arise in my mind with very little attention to formal method i set out with the proceedings of the revolution society but i shall not confine myself to them is it possible i should it appears to me as if i were in a great crisis not of the affairs of france alone but of all europe perhaps of more than europe all circumstances taken together the french revolution is the most astonishing that has hitherto happened in the world the most wonderful things are brought about in many instances by means the most absurd and ridiculous in the most ridiculous modes and apparently by the most contemptible instruments everything seems out of nature in the strange chaos of levity and ferocity and of all sorts of crimes jumbled together with all sorts of follies in viewing this monstrous tragicomic scene the most opposite passions necessarily succeed and sometimes mix with each other in the mind alternate contempt and indignation alternate laughter and tears alternate scorn and horror it cannot however be denied that to some this strange scene appeared in quite another point of view into them it inspired no other sentiments than those of exultation and rapture they saw nothing in what has been done in france but a firm and temperate exertion of freedom so consistent on the whole with morals and with piety as to make it deserving not only of the secular applause of dashing machiavellian politicians but to render it a fit theme for all the devout effusions of sacred eloquence on the forenoon of the fourth of november last dr richard price a non-conforming minister of eminence preached at the dissenting meeting-house of the old jewry to his club or society a very extraordinary miscellaneous sermon in which there are some good moral and religious sentiments and not ill expressed mixed up in a sort of porridge of various political opinions and reflections but the revolution in france is the grand ingredient in the cauldron i consider the address transmitted by the revolution society to the national assembly through earl stanhope as originating in the principles of the sermon and as a corollary from them it was moved by the preacher of that discourse it was passed by those who came reeking from the effect of the sermon without any censure or qualification expressed or implied if however any of the gentlemen concerned shall wish to separate the sermon from the resolution they know how to acknowledge the one and to disavow the other they may do it i cannot for my part i looked on that sermon as the public declaration of a man much connected with literary cabalers and intriguing philosophers with political theologians and theological politicians both at home and abroad i know they set him up as a sort of oracle because with the best intentions in the world he naturally philippizes and chants his prophetic song in exact unison with their designs that sermon is in a strain which i believe has not been heard in this kingdom in any of the pulpits which are tolerated or encouraged in it since the year sixteen forty eight when a predecessor of dr price the rev hugh peters made the vault of the king's own chapel at st james ring with the honor and privilege of the saints who with the quote, high praises of god in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hands were to execute judgment on the heathen and punishments upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron unquote, from psalm 149 few harangues from the pulpit except in the days of your league in france or in the days of our solemn league and covenant in england have ever breathed less of the spirit of moderation 
than this lecture in the old Jewry. Supposing, however, that something like moderation were visible in this political sermon, yet politics and the pulpit are terms that have little agreement. No sound ought to be heard in the church but the healing voice of Christian charity. The cause of civil liberty and civil government gains as little as that of religion by this confusion of duties. Those who quit their proper character to assume what does not belong to them are, for the greater part, ignorant both of the character they leave and of the character they assume, wholly unacquainted with the world in which they are so fond of meddling, and inexperienced in all its affairs on which they pronounce with so much confidence, they have nothing of politics but the passions they excite. Surely the church is a place where one day's truce ought to be allowed to the dissensions and animosities of mankind. This pulpit style, revived after so long a discontinuance, had to me the air of novelty, and of a novelty not wholly without danger. I do not charge this danger equally to every part of the discourse. The hint given to a noble and reverend lay divine, who is supposed high in office in one of our universities, and other lay divines of rank and literature, may be proper and seasonable, though somewhat new. If the noble seekers should find nothing to satisfy their pious fancies in the old staple of the national church, or in all the rich variety to be found in the well-assorted warehouses of the dissenting congregations, Dr. Price advises them to improve upon nonconformity, and to set up, each of them, a separate meeting-house upon his own particular principles. Footnote Quoting Dr. Price those who dislike that mode of worship which is prescribed by public authority ought, if they can find no worship out of the church which they approve, to set up a separate worship for themselves, and by doing this, and giving an example of a rational and manly worship, men of weight from their rank and literature may do the greatest service to society and the world. End of footnote. It is somewhat remarkable that this reverend divine should be so earnest for setting up new churches and so perfectly indifferent concerning the doctrine which may be taught in them. His zeal is of a curious character. It is not for the propagation of his own opinions, but of any opinions. It is not for the diffusion of truth, but for the spreading of contradiction. Let the noble teachers but dissent. It is no matter from whom or from what. This great point, once secured, it is taken for granted their religion will be rational and manly, I doubt whether religion would reap all the benefits which the calculating divine computes from this great company of great preachers. It would certainly be a valuable addition of nondescripts to the ample collection of known classes, genera, and species, which at present beautify the hortus siccus of dissent. A sermon from a noble duke, or a noble marquis, or a noble earl, or baron bold, would certainly increase and diversify the amusements of this town, which begins to grow satiated with the uniform round of its vapid dissipations. I should only stipulate that these new mess-johns, in robes and coronets, should keep some sort of bounds in the democratic and leveling principles which are expected from their titled pulpits. The new evangelists will, I dare say, disappoint the hopes that are conceived of them. They will not become literally as well as figuratively, polemic divines, nor be disposed so to drill their congregations that they may, as in former blessed times, preach their doctrines to regiments of dragoons and corps of infantry and artillery. Such arrangements, however favorable to the cause of compulsory freedom, civil and religious, may not be equally conducive to the national tranquillity. These few restrictions, I hope, are no great stretches of intolerance, no very violent exertions of despotism. But I may say of our preacher, Utinum nugus toda, illa dedeset tempora sevitiae. All things in this his fulminating bull are not of so innoxious a tendency. His doctrines affect our constitution in its vital parts. He tells the Revolution Society in this political sermon, that his majesty is almost the only lawful king in the world, because the only one who owes his crown to the choice of his people. As to the kings of the world, all of whom, except one, this archpontiff of the rights of men, 
with all the plenitude and with more than the boldness of the papal deposing power in its meridian fever of the twelfth century puts into one sweeping clause of ban and anathema and proclaims usurpers by circles of longitude and latitude over the whole globe it behooves them to consider how they admit into their territories these apostolic missionaries who are to tell their subjects they are not lawful kings that is their concern it is ours as a domestic interest of some moment seriously to consider the solidity of the only principle upon which these gentlemen acknowledge a king of great britain to be entitled to their allegiance 